Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Laura Haywood. I am so excited to start the day with one of my favorite people in the entertainment industry, and he is all over the industry. You'll recognize Coleman Domingo as the deliciously complicated Victor Strand on AMC's Fear the Walking Dead, and he's also a celebrated playwright. He wrote the book for Donna, the Donna Summer musical, currently glittering on Broadway. He's been nominated for Tony, Olivier, Drama Desk, Drama League, and NAACP awards, and he's currently developing new projects for AMC and HBO. We're going to talk about all of it. First, let's take a look at a scene from Fear the Walking Dead. You guys see any signs of survivors? None. And it's not only the survivors who are in absentia. The dead, where are they? We haven't seen one since we entered this burg. Yeah, neither have we. Hang on. We're gonna be another minute. I think there's someone around here. Looks like one person. I found what's left of their lunch. Copy. You know, she won't go back until she looks under every rock. Huh. It's the only reason I'm here. Only reason we're all here. But she didn't just find me down there. She saved me, and she didn't have to. Well, you know what she says. I do. But I made a pretty powerful argument to the contrary. I still never asked her why she helped me after what I did. <laughs> Ask her. What a scene. Man, I love Victor Strand. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you say you love Victor Strand. Well, he's, you know, I, I've been thinking about the question of whether Victor is a good guy or a bad guy. And I think at first I thought, well, he can't tell yet or we don't know. Right. And now I think I've decided he's both at the same time. Which is very interesting and complicated. Yeah. Right? And like last that. night's episode, we got a look at sort of how he could be either or both. Exactly, because he's being challenged again whether or not he should have a getaway plan or whether he, um, you know, should stick with the group. Right. And I think that he's just naturally, it's part of his, um, his instincts is to plan for things to fall apart. Mm -hmm. and, but then he's challenged in the episode to, um, to do good for the others, and that's what he does eventually. Yeah. He, he always has to come around to it, though. Well, and I feel like it's not like he's just landed there and now he's going to be sort of in it for all. No. He'll no, no, always no. have his, his one, every man for himself. <laughs> I think so. I think that's what's, what makes him strong as well. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, even more complicated. I think as we've unpeeled the onion that is Victor Strand, we've seen that he's so complex and so interesting to play. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm just having a great time with him. Are the people that you spend time with on camera the people you spend time with off camera? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kim Dickens has become one of my dearest friends. She's the the relationship that uh, Madison and Strand has built up. It's it really marries the way we built up our relationship mm -hmm. and our friendship. She really has become a sister to me. And um, Frank Delane and Alicia Debnam Carrier are sort of my my younger siblings. So we're really we're very close and we laugh a lot. And also the new the new members, uh, Jenna Elfman, Maggie Grace, Lenny James, everyone's awesome. And Garrett Delahunt, they're just brilliant people. With the addition of Lenny to the cast, we're yeah. really kind of in a new era of fear. Yeah. Um, I know that there are people that are starting to watch now who may not have seen the first few episodes because yeah. they love Lenny in the original series so much. Yeah, you know, it's, it's been wild in that way. We've sort of always been its sort of um, its younger cousin to mm -hmm. The Walking Dead, but we've had our own fan base, and now it's been growing and building. And uh, last season, I thought, was one of our best seasons, season three. Mm -hmm. And so moving into four, I know that they wanted to also really challenge the fans and really uh, push the envelope and really um, land our characters more in their to become their more iconic selves. Mm -hmm. And now, now that, so now we're, we're past, you know, all these decisions on, oh, well, should we take them in or not? You're like, no, it's now about survival. <laughs> You're not gonna make some hard choices. Um, and I think that's more interesting and complicated. What is, what are the iconic characteristics of Victor Strand? Oh, wow. I think that, you know, for the longest time, I wondered what kind of a weapon Victor Strand would have. Mm -hmm. And I thought his, his strongest weapon has always been his silver tongue. Oh. <laughs> you know, because he can talk his way out of anything mm -hmm. and he can negotiate. And I thought that that's very um, 
interesting and complex and things that I don't usually see. Usually see someone has a, a crossbow or a knife <laughs> or, a or, stick. or a <laughs> stick or something. You know, Victor Strand still, I, I don't think Victor Strand still has found his yet sort of like an exterior weapon. I think mm -hmm. it's still on the inside. That's his strongest weapon is his mind because he's very intelligent and he's uh, very quick thinking. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of his iconic self as well. Like, you look at Madison. She's wearing, rocking a, a leather jacket now. Mm -hmm. It looks like All Saints or something. Somehow, you know, it was the apocalypse, but All Saints seemed to uh, stick around for a minute. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, also, um, Victor has found sort of um, armor that he needed. You know, he could no longer live with a, a Ralph Lauren suit or, you know, he's wearing very casual, you know, dockers and boating gear. Now he's, like, prepared for the elements mm -hmm. and for fighting. He still survival. looks so stylish. You know, though. I think that no matter what he does, he will always try to find a little style. In some do you way. have any Im influence on the, the wardrobe? Do you go in and, and collaborate with the costumers? We have a phenomenal costume designer. Um, her name is Jo, Jo, jo Capsaris. And what she does, she really uh, collaborates with us. So we really talk about thematically the beginning of this season when I knew that where they were trying to open Victor up and say that he's um, more about his heart chakra, I thought, well, I think he should be in red. And mm -hmm. the first thing she pulled out was a red uh, jacket. I think I'm actually wearing it in that scene, that we, the clip that mm -hmm. we just did. Because I thought, like, that's a color that we never would think we would see Victor Strand in. He's always been in very stark colors, like, you know, navies and, and black and, and white. And now I wanted to uh, have him more in color because that's just um, subtly showing you what he's trying to become. Mm -hmm. You know, he's trying to wear it more on his, um, on, on his sleeve. So Joe uh, listens to us and really... Um, uh, we, we've had some you know, some run-ins when, because it, there's a certain look that they like Victor Strand in, and at some point I'm like, you know, I can't possibly go and pick up everything that fits me well. Can it be a little <laughs> oversized or right. undersized? And so we, we're very detailed about that work, like making sure the, the how we're, we're, things are worn and what the story is behind mm -hmm. that. So it, jo, with Joe, there's a story behind every single thing yeah. in the costume. I always wonder about the zombies who, you know, were the fashion models and the fashion icons and whether they're walking around in their, I think, I, you know, I, I, would, I would love to see an episode couture. to see that, exactly. <laughs> to see, like, you know, some distressed couture and then, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm sure probably Alicia would yeah, rip yeah, it off she, of her and wear it, you know, <laughs> if it's an old Halston, uh, a vintage Halston or something. <laughs> that would be amazing, like <laughs> right? prom and the zombie ap apocalypse. <laughs> exactly. Go, go find... Uh, whatever you want to wear. I understand that there's also collaborators between the actors and the writer's room on this show, which actually surprised me. Well, you know, um, I think the key to any uh, writer's room, uh, especially with our new showrunners, our old showrunners as well, like, but Dave Erickson was very uh, collaborative in that way, and our new showrunners, uh, Andrew and Ian, they really, they, they will lay out a story for you and tell you what it is, and then you can, you can uh, voice your opinion about mm -hmm. it. The, we were talking about... Um, the effect that Cole, the character Cole, that mm -hmm. you see me in the scene with um, in last night's episode, it was Cole, they were, they were trying to strike up a, a romantic relationship with Victor. And uh, because they thought that this is part of, you know, Victor trying to do in, um, new things and build to, you know, having more of an open heart. Mm -hmm. And that it was just something complicated about me, for me, with that relationship. Because I thought, Victor Strand is so complex, I don't know if he would really appeal to someone saying, I like you. I think mm -hmm. that he says, okay, you like me, let me show you as he does. And that was part of our rewrite. I think he needs to, Victor Strand would say, this is the monster that I can be. Mm. And if you're cool with that, then we can take the next step. But I'm going to be, there's no time for sort of child, childish games of I like you. This is the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. I need to know whether or not you're going to deal with all this complicated um, mess that I am. And, uh, and so that's the challenge. And that was part of um, a discussion we had with the writers. You know, so we knew we, it wasn't exactly, I knew what they wanted, but w how to get to it. Um, I'm sort of as a, one of now the OGs and being being <laughs> beholden to the story um, and to the characters that you, that I that I think they look to me and Kim and Alicia and Frank to also have that influence as well because we know these characters so well. It's nice that they that they allow you to be the pr the primary expert on this person that yeah. has l lived inside of you yeah. uh, for, for this long. I'm also wondering how that experience changes you as a writer. Because when you're on the other side of the table, I can imagine perhaps it's hard to, to let anybody else influence the characters you have created. You know what? I, I, you know what? I don't 
as a writer, I don't find it hard at all. Mm. I think I actually, usually even the way I write, I usually write the first 30 pages of, of a script, and then I invite actors to come in, and, and I would ask them questions. Um, is it clear what you need? Is it clear what you want? Um, what do you think this character is going? What's interesting and complicated? So I need that. I need that mm. interaction as well, because I really do believe that like it is such a collaborative form. It isn't just about me writing in my, in my office. It's about me um, seeing how this... How can we build this thing together? And you need actors, and you need actors to tell you exactly, and you know they'll tell you what it is. And so I think that, uh, uh, I think it takes a sense of being open mm -hmm. and not feeling um, beholden and feeling like it's so precious. You've got to invite collaborators in, and I think when you sometimes you bump up a little against it a little bit because people are like, "These are the words I thought this through," and I respect writers. Mm -hmm. I respect writers wholly. Um, but also I would the, hope so. You yeah, are one. Yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> but you know, I mean, there's actors that, you know, listen, I've been on sets where actors come in and they feel like the, the writers just, you know, I don't know, they dream this up and they, um, not that they disrespect it, but they're like, can I say this instead? And it's mm. like, you know that every word was well thought out by this writer. And I just think there's a different way to collaborate and to talk to your, your writers about that. You know what I mean? I think you offer up another solution and why, mm -hmm. and, you, and you make it a collaborative, you know, and also just respects the word. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's talk about the project that you have written that is on Broadway right now. Yeah. You're the co-book writer on Summer, the Donna Summer musical. I am. And when I said it glitters on Broadway, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. there, not only are there giant disco balls and <laughs> yeah. sequins on every costume, but uh, you, you walk out of the theater literally glittering. <laughs> exactly. Um, we talk need to that me right about now. your, oh my gosh, do we ever. Talk to me about your role in Summer and how long you've been working on it and just your feelings oh, about it I, I've been so blessed to join this team. Des Mackinoff reached out to me uh, about four years ago. Um, he's been familiar with my work as a playwright, and we sat down and we had a meeting about Donna Summer. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought that he was actually, in any meeting, I always think that they're looking at me as an actor first. And I mm. thought, well, what role is in this for me? And he said, well, I think that you'd be a wonderful book writer on this. He said, I think you're going to write fantastic musicals. And this, I'd just been a playwright. And he says, no, you, what you do with character and story, I think that there's um, there's a world for you here. And I agreed, and I thought, with Donna Summer in particular, I thought, I think I have something to give to it. Mm -hmm. And I have questions about it. How do we take icons out of their iconography and make them very human? Mm. Um, that's what I'm interested in. I have another piece about Nat King Cole that I wrote as well that goes up next year at the Geffen, which is about so very much about like deconstructing an icon. So with Donna Summer in particular, I just, I got to know her family, I got to know, um, um, all the, these private things about her that you would, I think, what I think in it, someone who's a legend like Donna Summer would want to give to her fans. I think the, the piece is not cynical at all. I think it's um, very, it, it's one big open heart. And I think it, it's, honestly, I think, I'll say this, and I'm gonna sound like such a, a Pollyanna, but I don't care. <laughs> it really is simply joyful. Uh -huh. um, it's spiritual because that's also what Donna Summer was. And I think it really just holds up her legacy and gives you some um, some fragments of her life and builds on this person who's taking, um, it's, it's imagined as her final concert, the final concert that she would want to give to her fans mm -hmm. and to her daughters and to her husband. Um, when you look back at a life and what are you leaving behind? What are young women going to, uh, how they're going to be empowered for the next generations? You know, there would be no Beyonce if there was no Donna Summer. Plain well simple. said. Uh, <laughs> uh, but she had to do many things to knock down doors, to you know, have ownership, have agency in her own career. Um, and so it's, it's so meaningful. And the simplest thing, I went to the matinee yesterday. I've never seen this in my entire career. Audiences uh, on a, on on the radio when she's singing with Ariana DeBose and her Tony nominated oh my God. performance Ella Shans are both singing on the radio. A couple just got up and started <gasps> doing the hustle, and then okay, then it gets better. And then at last dance, which is really the um, the cherry on top of the show for me, suddenly my my friend uh, Sharon Washington went with me, uh -huh. elbows me, and she said, and she looks over and there's a couple holding each other, they're holding their faces quietly as if they're in their own living room. And they're just have, singing um, Last Dances, they're, they're performing that, and they're just having this beautiful, intimate moment, I almost started crying. Aww. And everyone was singing along to songs. It really is, it's such, I think it's simply like, a, a such a, it's, not, it's not a show for cynics. You gotta come <laughs> in just wanting to have a good time and be taken to heaven. And we take you to Studio 54 at some point. Mm -hmm. And we take you to all these places that I think that people have in their minds and nostalgia, or young people feel like, oh, this is what it was like. This is a woman who was in the center of this, there will be disco is Donna Summer. Yeah. You know the '70s, but she owned the '70s and '80s. And I think um, it's been such 
an extraordinary ride and for it to not only play at La Jolla Playhouse, but then move to Broadway, especially in this culture that we're in right now. It's very much a, a female centric show mm -hmm. um, that was very much on the minds of Des and I and Robert Carey that we wanted to make it a very female centric show. Uh, yeah, it's written by, you know, men and the, but more than anything, I want it, it to be so female empowered. All the shows I write are very, you know, feminist in some mm -hmm. way, but this has um, uh, a 75% uh, female cast and a 95% female band as well. Wow. And so things about that, that's important to me. It's also important. I, that's, that was already like four years ago we started thinking about this, but who knew that the, we were heading into this is part of what we need in our culture right now. Um, and it, I think it's really just showing the, the legacy of Donna Summer and what she leaves behind and what she, how she was going to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, and also just, it's just a fun, fun night in the theater. It sure is. 100 minutes. There's disco balls. There's sexy costumes. There's women killing it, doing bad girls. It's it's everything. I have never seen a performance like Ariana DeBose no. playing Disco Donna. No. Like she's, she's one of the rare triple oh. threats that we have. I mean, I saw her yesterday and I thought, She's in the line of like ch the Cheetah Rivera's and the uh, Liza Minnelli's. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of performance. And LaShawn's, it's just a, another legendary legendary performance. Right. I, I did the whiz with LaShawn's and I, and I still had no idea that she had the voice that she has for summer. She's dropping her voice in a lower register and she's, she has an 11, 11 o'clock number that really just blows the roof off and she gets a standing ovation. There's sometimes, there's sometimes I've heard there's been three standing ovations in the middle of the show. Wow. Yeah, and she gets one of them. Does not surprise me at all. So you've been working on this project for four years, yeah. but for a lot of that four years, you were in Mexico filming Fear the Walking Dead. Yeah. How did, were you commuting? Were yes. you telecommuting? Yes, I was commuting and I was telecommuting. I was doing everything. But that's just, that's the nature of this. When you plant seeds for a long time mm -hmm. and you have your, your garden that is growing all over the place, I, you know, it's no problem for me to hop on a plane and go and nurture that. Like, I literally, if I told you, the, I think I was telling you what my week was, you know, I, I directed the last episode of Fear the Walking Dead. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. so excited to oh, talk the, to you about yeah. that. But You've the, never directed TV before, and no, now here no. you are directing this yeah. hit television I, I, series. I shadowed Andrew Bernstein, who was um, our producing director last season, um, and then... I wanted to direct this season, and I wanted to. They put me on for the back half, which I thought was smart as well, because mm -hmm. I wanted to continue to learn. And then, so I went from uh, directing episode four twelve to starring in episode four thirteen, and then I got, a, and then I went on a flight to L.A. and I started editing, and I was in the editing bay for a couple of days. And Saturday night, I got on a red eye and flew here, and now I'm here. I saw Donna Summer yesterday, and I'm here. So anything you love. I, you know what? It's it's just a plane right away, mm -hmm. so I can go anywhere. So I, I would go back and forth from Mexico to here, uh, Mexico to LA, you name it. But I'm I'm so enjoying what I'm doing that it's nothing. It's it's never a problem. I'll always get some sleep on a plane. I sleep well now on planes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Did you learn more about Victor Strand as a director on Fear? Did you have Did you direct any of your own I, scenes? I didn't direct any of my own scenes, but what I did learn is. Um, how to hopefully as an actor, how to be be an even better collaborator with my production team. Mm. You know, like when they call you and they knock on your dressing room door and you make it out of your dressing room within maybe five minutes, just mm -hmm. know that five minutes stacks up and mm -hmm. then it could be an, a director can be an hour behind. So little things like that that you don't even know. You're just like, you feel like you're just a cog in the wheel, but it's actually like such an enormous, I mean, these episodes I think cost like $4 million an episode, something like that. Um, and it's time is money. Eight days of prep and eight days of shooting mm -hmm. and you've got to be on it if you're trying to make your day and get all the work in. And I love directing. It's my new passion. I love. I've been directing theater for 25 years, and but directing television is now a great, a great new challenge. I think. I think we talked about this before. Usually, I do something because it's a challenge. I'll write a solo show because I never wrote a solo show, right. and I'll write a very surreal comedy because I never wrote one, and then I'll write a dining room drama because I, this is the way I think. Um, how to build one, and so everything is a, a new challenge, and so now my challenge is television. I'm so excited that you're doing all of these things. And one of my favorite things about you has always been that you refuse to put yourself into a box as a writer, as a director, as an actor. Um, and especially when you're doing these things at such a high level. I will never forget the first time I saw you on stage in Passing Strange 10 years ago, uh, for which you were Tony nominated. Again, Tony nominated for um, Scottsboro Boys. And these performances, you could very easily make a living as an actor and only an actor, especially now that you're on a hit TV show, yeah. and yet you're still continuing to push yourself to grow, and I think that's such an incredible thing. Thank you. I consider myself just you know, um, a, a creative, 
And I think that it doesn't matter to me where it is. It's like, you know, it's all the same. It's all one. So when someone says, oh, you're out here doing, like I was directing a show last um, fall at the Huntington Theater because I wanted to direct that play. And it was just a two-hander and being and very small and we're here in Boston. And because I, I go where the work is. Mm -hmm. And then next, you know, I'm doing work as an actor or, you know, I did um, Barry Jenkins' new film that's coming out at mm -hmm. Beale Street could talk. So it's like, I like to go back and forth. And that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I think people are always trying to say, well, which one do you like best? Which one do you really love to do? And I say, all of it. Yeah. And I really do. And But it's hard because we don't really see a lot of a lot of us the 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 um maybe quadruple um slash backslash mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you know what i mean um i think that um but you know there's people like you know denai guerrera there's you yeah. know you know I'm, I'm part of the generation i think I, I looked up to people like jeffrey holder and george wolf and um people who do everything mm -hmm. um clint eastwood um these are people that i that i admire because i think that you know they're just trying to um do the work and it's a matter of uh how their their entry point is, as long as they're getting the work done. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about Walking Dead fans, because I know you've started going to these conventions. You have a big one coming up in Nashville. Um, are people dressing up like Strand? What's your relationship like with the <laughs> fandom? I think, you know, people, you know, the funny thing is, someone dressed up as Strand, and I didn't even recognize that it was Strand he was dressed up as. You know, his girlfriend was like, look at him, look at him. I was, yeah, he's, he's a nice guy. I'm he's his well dressed. Yeah, well dressed, nice. And they're like, oh, no, no, he's, I'm like, oh, he's cosplaying me. Oh, I get it, I get it. Um, I think now that, um, it's so cool. I think that the best part about doing these conventions, and I just do like a couple a year. Um, there's nothing, there's something so extraordinary and kind and generous about it all. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, it's all so, it's just people who are such fans and they come with so much love. You feel like you're part of the family. You know your picture is going to be on their mantle. Uh -huh. um, and it means something to them. They bring people from like the Make-A-Wish Foundation and your, mm -hmm. you know, our army veterans or people who have been disabled. And you're able to just communicate with people and get out there. And that's the part of being a part of television now that I really um, respond to because it's get, it's fulfilling me with the thing that I miss in the theater. Mm. When you come outside and, you, and you're talking to the people that you just experienced this thing, you just had church with, you know, in the theater for two and a half hours. Now I get to go out into communities to where they live and they're like, I can't believe you're actually here. I live down the street. Yeah. And you're, so, but you're in my home and I know you and I love you. When people say they love you, that's, it's wonderful. And I think, it, especially I love with our fan base. Our fan base is so widespread. I think, the idea of coming together in this country, um, you know, where we, wherever we are politically, emotionally, how we're all feeling, we can come together with, um, you know, a show about survival, mm -hmm. where it's not about, you know, um, race and gender and politics. It's just about how do we look after each other. And so when I go out into these communities, I go to Nashville or Atlanta or whatever, I feel like I'm really, I'm really meeting it head on, and I'm really part of the American conversation in some way, because I feel like it's just about love and generosity, and yeah. like they, they admire this character, and he's complex, and I love the fact that he's so complex, and I'm sure that he he's outside of many people's wheels wheelhouse of what they will accept or what they believe in, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, Victor Strand and his same-sex relationship, whether it's the way he treats fellow a uh, fellow man, but they they love him. He's so complicated, and mm -hmm. so they're able to unpack whatever they're feeling. About about Victor, um, this um, using him in this iconography to deconstruct what they feel, and so it invites them into their home, into their lives in a different way, and I think it's really powerful. Cool. Um, I would love to give our audience a chance to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Hi. Um, I just noticed that on the show that uh, Victor Strand seems to like. Uh, whenever he has a chance, like he always tends to leave, but then always draws himself back to the group. I was wondering what makes him come back so much? What makes Victor Strand come back so much? I think he comes back because ultimately he knows that he needs people. Uh, he thinks of himself as a loner and an individual, but he knows that it's best. And I think we're finding, we, we're seeing that Victor, he, we know that he feels his best when he's in service to others whether he's in service to Thomas Abigail or service to Madison Clark and her family, um, and now being in service to a, a large community. And this, it keeps surprising him, because he doesn't know that. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? He thinks of himself as like, you know, I, you know, I've always thought of myself as being like, you know, you can think of yourself as one way, and then, but the world sees you another way. And actually, that's your best self. And so I think that's why he comes back, because I think, in particular, Madison, played by that beautiful Kim Dickens, um, makes him feel the best and makes him his self-worth. He, he knows that he's, um, he can see in her eyes the man that he can be if he doesn't believe in himself. 
Like maybe she saved him in more ways than one. Exactly. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, and vice versa. Yeah, okay. exactly. Who else has a question? Hey, um, first let me say congratulations on the success of Summer. Thank you. Uh, it's really well, wonderful. Thank you. Um, my question is about Fear the Walking Dead. How do you feel Victor Strand has changed or evolved from the first three seasons to the fourth season, being that there's that time jump? I think Victor Strand has evolved, evolved in the most dynamic ways. Uh, he was very much, um, I would say season one was the, the introduction to this enigma wrapped in a mystery, <laughs> wrapped in cash, right? As I'll, I'll quote Erica Jane, <laughs> something like that. And, uh, and then season two was part of his deconstruction uh, to really deconstruct sort of, I think, like Western civilization as well, because everything that Victor Strand stood for was, you know, commerce and all these things that you can, you can be a well-made, self-made man um, and wealthy and, and, and victorious. And then it was deconstructed and he had mm -hmm. to really think about what was really important to him. Season three, I think he really had to go into some soul work and some soul searching that I think he was very uncomfortable with. Just imagine that. That, that means our culture has to do some soul searching, you know, when, when money is not involved. And then season four, it's now more about like, um, especially with the time jump, it is about survival in a different way. Taking all that you have learned and now what choices are you gonna make? And I think that Victor is now on the precipice of becoming, I think, and we'll find out if our writers agree, I think <laughs> there's something, an incredible hero in there that he was unaware of. I think that's an interesting journey. Or he could become a villain, you never know. He's on the precipice. Do you know that I never thought about the etymology of the name Victor before? He Until you just it. said victorious, and I was like, oh my gosh, his, his name is Victor. Like, he, he's he, going to win this thing. That's, that's what he says <laughs> in the, like, uh, one episode in season three. He said something just like that. Yeah. My mother named me Victor because she always knew I'd be victorious. Right, yeah. Right? So uh, it's, it's, but it's, Strand also has this, you know, it's like there's a strand going this way and there's a strand going that way. Exactly. And, oh, Everything man, has those double writers meaning. are so brilliant. Aren't they great? <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one. One more question. Hi. Artistically, what do you look forward to as a TV and theater director? What do I forward to? What do you look forward to? What do I look forward to as a TV director? Oh, wow. I look forward to directing really complex television. Um, I never saw myself as being someone who, it makes sense to me that my first episode of directing is a Fear of the Walking Dead. I think it's such a, um, it really is like shooting uh, a small film a $4 million dollar film in, in eight days. And I look forward to um, whether I direct things like Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I wish Mad Men was still in the air. I would love to direct Mad Men. I just complicated stories, but it doesn't matter. They can be big moving pieces, but also they just have to be, have very strong, complex characters and story. And I think ultimately, I know that the thing that I'm good at is really bringing out the humanity um, in a piece of work. Um, that's what I'm striving for. I'm always pushing, whether it's actors or designers, uh, creatives, to do the soul work, because that's what I'm interested in. Um, if we get nothing else out of an episode, I want you to, to feel something and be changed and just maybe move the dial just a hair. Um, that's what I'm interested in, and I push for that. So hopefully more television that does that. And right now I'm working, um, I'm developing two, two series right now. I sold one show to AMC based on my play Dot about an... Um, elderly woman with Alzheimer's and her adult children, and I'm developing that for AMC as a one-hour drama, and I have a show um, that is sold to HBO called Sweet Lady Kickers that is about an all-female kickball league in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, all women over 40, very interesting. Thematically, um, uh, yeah, I'm a man sitting here, but I write mostly female characters because you know I admire women so much and their strength and tenacity and courage and humor, and so women populate my work. And uh, so now I'm writing a, a, a half-hour comedy that'll be centered on these very complicated, interesting women over 40 that I feel like stories that, you know, I hear all my girlfriends talking about and I want to put them front and center. Are you going to be directing on those projects as yes, well? Yes, I'll be directing on those projects. Love I want to direct on those projects. I'll ex I'm going to executive produce and I'll write them. Amazing. Yeah. Coleman, you're just one of my favorite people. I love you so much, and I'm so glad that you spent this time with us today. We're going to watch you every week on Fear the Walking Dead. Everybody go see Summer. It's such a fun night at the theater. Um, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you for you everything. You Laura. Thank you. And please, everyone, follow Laura as well. Oh. Laura's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful spirit. Thank, Thank you. you.